during my last semester in, in seminary, my workload was a little bit lighter. I had less required reading to do, so the pile of books was a little bit shorter, so I got to read some um, other books and books that um, I wanted to read for some time. And I was introduced by, an, uh, I was introduced to a man named Pat Lencioni and uh, started devouring through his books there that semester. And one of those books that he wrote was, or is called The Advantage. It's a number of years ago, it was a New York Times bestseller and it's subtitled, Why Organizational Health Trumps Everything Else in Business. And in this book, what he does is he lays out four categories in which any business organization or church, what they need to do in order to become healthy. And in one of those categories, he says an organization, business or church needs to answer these six critical questions. And of those six questions, the first one that any business or church needs to ask themselves is this question. Why? do we exist? Not have any clarity on that question, there's a lack of focus, there's a lack of like, what do we put our attention on? Like, what are we striving for? What's our, what's our aim? There's frustration that oftentimes take place when there's not clarity on why we exist. So, why does this church exist? Why does Notre Dame here on the corner of Norfolk in Chicago and golf. Why is it here? How would you how would you answer that question? Don't answer it right now. Hold it. Because these next couple of weeks we want to take an opportunity to to what we're calling doing some vision casting. Sharing of the some of some of the fruit of what the leadership team has been working on the last number of months on why we exist as we move forward here, what's our purpose? And today is just more of a, just kind of wet or whistle a little bit by looking at three things, the need, looking at Shia LaBeouf, and then looking at the answer. So first, the need. It's hard to believe that I've been pastor here now for over 14 months. As I was sharing with somebody the other day, at times it feels like I've been here just three months, and at other times, it feels like I've been here for 30 years, but 14 months. And I want to remember every, I want to ask everyone to remember 14 months ago, my very first weekend here, that first weekend in July. And I want you to remember for a second on what I, what I said in that first homily. I'm sure everybody remembers, right? But maybe we'll, 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 we'll remind you, we'll, 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 uh, We'll say this for our new, our new families, our new parishioners uh, who, who are here with us that weren't there in July. But what I shared is I shared a number of convictions that I had that I was coming with. And those convictions that I came here with that I shared over the last 14 months, they've only, they deepened. One of those convictions is, is the fact that the world is crying out. I pointed to the fact that, that the life expectancy in the, in the United States is declining. 2017, 2018, 2019, for the first time in over 100 years, there was three consecutive years in the mighty US with all the medical advancements that we have, the life expectancy has declined, of which experts called was large part because of deaths by despair, liver cirrhosis, opioids, and suicides. Coincidentally, just I think seven days ago or eight days ago, the CDC released, released the numbers for 2021. And that decline in life expectancy has only increased. And now what we have is 2020 and 2021, we now have the, 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 the steepest two-year decline in life expectancy in this country since the 20s. Now, of course, COVID was going on, which played a part into it, but as a Princeton professor, who won the Nobel Prize said, don't let the pandemic fool you. Because that three year string of decreased life expectancy was going on before COVID. And the acceleration has also helped then with those, the suicide overdoses and alcohol related liver diseases, which he pointed to that in the last two decades in some groups, it has increased those deaths by 387%. 
just in the last seven days or eight days, I've now anointed and given last rites to one just on Friday afternoon to two men my age who are dying of liver cirrhosis. After the 1130 mass, after the next mass, I'll be heading to hospice to anoint another man. I was talking a couple of days ago to a local therapist. She was telling me she <clears throat> along, she's got, there's 50 therapists where she works. And she says, Father Mark, we are so swamped with referrals that at any given time, we have over 200 people on a waiting list seeking therapy. There's an article in the Atlantic that came out recently that said feelings of sadness and hopelessness among American teenagers rose from 26 to 44% over the last 10 years. It goes on to say that's across, that's across every race, location, and demographic. Without God, without God, there is no hope. As we, as we push God to the side, as our culture does, as Paul, as Paul says in his, one of his letters to the Ephesians in chapter two, he says, With, without God, there's no hope. There's no future but darkness, he says. And as convicted as we are here as a, as a leadership team and, and as a staff, convicted that the world's crying out, we're even more convicted that in, that in Jesus Christ, there's power. There's life-changing power in the good news of the gospel, that the, that the gospel message brings about healing, that it brings hope. And people are, people are longing to hear it and to know it. Which brings me to Shia LaBeouf. I was recently watching an interview between uh, Bishop Barron and an actor, Shia LaBeouf, I remember Shia LaBeouf when I was a kid, he, he played a show on Saturday morning that my siblings and I watched called Even Stevens. And I had it realized, but as he got older, he, kind of, he made it really big as a, like an A-list actor in Hollywood and you know, in big blockbuster films like Transformers and what happens a lot of times with childhood stars as they grow older, they fall on hard times. And that was the case for Shia LaBeouf. And his, he's in this interview with Bishop Barron, he says that he, he mentioned that he goes, he said, my life was on fire. My life was a complete mess. Everything from theft, abusing women, battery, drugs. He says, I was disgusted with myself. I was despondent. He mentioned that things got so bad at one point that like throughout the news, there were things going out that, that he was intentionally giving women STDs. And he said, things got so bad that, the, that Hollywood even blacklisted him, wouldn't even cast him from, from roles. And he said he, he was in a spot where he, was, he had so much shame from, from, what he, what, from what he had done and what he was doing. He had so much guilt. He says, he described at one point there, he had a gun on a table and he says, I didn't want to live anymore. There was shame like I had never experienced before. The kind of shame where you forget how to breathe where you don't know where to go. He talked to the fact that he, like he didn't even want to open the blinds and, and, and go outside. It was right around that time when he got a call to play a priest in a movie, to play Padre Pio. And he thought this would be his chance. So he dove in and fully immersed himself in learning of what the life of Padre Pio was as a Cistercian monk. And, he, and he, he, he went to a monastery and he just started by just sleeping in the parking lot just to watch them and eventually was invited in and brought in. And he spent time with those monks. What happened was his heart began to open up. His heart began to break open as he began to, to, to experience the gospel. And at one point, Bishop Barron was like, so, so these monks were, began to kind of tell you the gospel and share the gospel with you. And Shia LaBeouf just stopped him and he said, Is he, it's even more than that. He, he said, they, they just, they, they, they invited me into their laughter. They let me eat their ice cream. They let me pet their cats. They just, they, they just shared life with him. And he, he, he mentioned how the fact that he just had this, this sense that it was just this non-judgmental, 
these, these monks just meeting him where, where he was at in his brokenness and his loneliness and him being lost and despairing, not knowing where to turn. As, as a church here, moving forward, we, 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 we need it. We don't, we, we need to communicate. We need to be known that we don't need to be, people to think that they need to be all clean and proper to be here. For people to know that it's okay to not be okay. Like if you're here this morning and like, I'm not okay. It's okay to not be okay and be here. He, been, he mentioned the fact that he felt, he, he felt so unworthy to even seek out God or religion, he said. He said, I was seeing, but when he was there with the, with the monks there, he said he began to, to see people and to hear stories who, who, who have also sinned, who also had been in a, lo, a low spot. He said, who, I, I saw that they were, they were in a spot where they found Christ, that Christ found them or found them. And he says, I, was, I felt like, okay, that gives me hope. He said, it made me feel like that I had permission to go to him. It made me feel like possibly that God might be the answer that God maybe was extending his hand out to me too, like he extended his hand out to Augustine. See, Jesus saved Shia LaBeouf's life. He, he rescued him because Shia, La, Shia LaBeouf had a life-changing encounter with Jesus. And it was just through shallow entry, like very low pressure, non-judgmental things and conversations, even just sharing laughter, ice cream, and petting cats. There are tons of Shia LaBeoufs out there. Now, like, we're not, we're not talking like Hollywood. We're talking, we're talking people on our streets. We're talking about our kids, our grandkids, a sibling, people that we walk the halls in high school with. It might even be us here this morning. What if, what if Notre Dame, what if this parish became a place that was known around town where the brokenhearted would flock to, 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 to find hope, to find healing, to find meaning and purpose in a life and in a world and in a culture that just has people turns upside down in confusion. That's what we need to become. So the answer to the question, lastly, why do we exist? We exist to offer a life changing encounter with Jesus. So all might be rescued and have abundant life. That's why we exist. The three parables that we heard in our gospel today, what they convey, they convey the, at the core, the father's heart. The woman, she, she turns her house upside down to look for a lost coin. The shepherd leaves the 99 to go and search for the one who's out there, who's hurting, who's broken, who's confused, who doesn't know where home is and doesn't know how to get there. To get what was lost back. That's who, that's who God is, that's his, that's his heart. And that's what, need, that, that's, what our, that's what our heart needs to become as a parish and as, in, as individuals. And the other, another conviction I shared that first weekend and I re reiterate it now, and I'm more convinced of it, is that Jesus wants to do remarkable things at this parish. To be a magnet and a light for people who are hurting because they have not yet had a life-changing encounter with Jesus. So I'm asking all of you to get on board with why this church exists, to get on the bus, because it's gonna take a lot of hands. It's gonna take a lot of work. 
And maybe just for this week, maybe for this week, our prayer is, 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 is Lord, break open my heart more, that my heart reflects more your heart for those that are away. Maybe it's, Lord, help me know to the extent that you've rescued me so that I might be more eager and wanting to go rescue others. Because it's why we exist, to offer a life-changing encounter with Jesus so all might be rescued and have abundant life.